it's been staggering. I mean, people, the, 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 the naysayers will say it took a massive pullback and correction in Q4 of 2018 to set the market up for the big run that we've had this year. So is it something where the room is there for this bull market to keep going and running? Well, our outlook for 2020 has a record high for U.S. corporate profits in the coming year. We think 7 percent, roughly, of probably a little bit of upside if we were to completely take out uh, trade disruptions entirely. Uh, I do think that that's global. But we have to do remember that this was a over 20 percent return year that the expectation for where we're going in the economy has been set in financial markets. We think that the coming year will not repeat that full gain. But there's a very, very big difference from that, from sort of believing that the end is there uh, and simply just having a great year behind us means that there's no room for any appreciation. And we're getting increasingly optimistic again that the world economy can follow through, that there's been a great anticipation, as you were just saying, for economic downturn, that producers everywhere poised for this collapse. Uh, and it's not happening. And that requires a bounce back. All right. So the positioning has been maybe a little bit more cynical. And that's the reason why we're seeing kind of a fuel for this right now. Trillion so, and a half of outflows. So exactly <laughs> right. So we talk about trade developments. We talk about Brexit. Let's take a, a worldwide view. Where is the opportunity right now? If you were to say, hey, I got to put money somewhere. Is it the U.S.? Is it abroad? And if it's abroad, where? Well, look, um, there's been a nice big valuation gap between the United States and international equities for a very long period of time. In some cases, that just reflects different industry composition, different growth opportunities. If we look at the 10 years ahead, valuation differences become much more critical over a decade. And we can see that non-U.S. equity returns, particularly emerging markets, are poised for stronger 10-year returns. I don't think that the coming year is telling us that this is going to be some dramatic difference, but you certainly have a lack of confidence in some other markets, whether this is Asia or Europe, and lower valuations, shades us to be a little bit more optimistic overall there. I think a big issue for us right now is there are bounce back sectors. Industrials had twice the return of healthcare in 2019. But if you look at over two years, healthcare outperformed industrials. And why is that? Industrials are cyclicals. There was the expectation of collapse coming into 2019, so they got deeply depressed. But bounce backs don't last forever. And what we really think about is driving long-term economic growth. There are these unstoppable trends inside technology in terms of- Like what? Well, cybersecurity is just one simple example where it's very, very high up the list of absolutely critical spending for companies. Small segment within IT. Software, generally, applications are rising faster uh, than technology hardware. They're gaining share in the economy, the best applications. They may be expensive, they may be volatile, but they outperform the long run. Investing in longevity, the amount of spending for a globally aging population is going up in healthcare. Well, we don't necessarily have the political issues just in the United States. These are examples, uh, again, of industries that are outperforming. They're not just bouncing back. What about financial technology, fintech Absolutely. as people call it. It could be payment services, it could be alternative banking or credit related products. Especially how, how globally. Big, how, how big of a deal is that globally? Um, it's incipient, it's come, uh, these companies, the concentrated firms who are in that area are growing their revenue 12% annually, consistently. And if you think about that revenue growth rate, how far, how much faster that is than the world economy. This, again, is something that doesn't have a 40-year track record behind it, uh, but we definitely overweight and find companies in that area quite compelling for long-term investments. All right. And, and also, 2019, a, a, an interesting year, as it has been most recently in the past decade, a bull market for stocks and a real bull market for oh, yes. bonds. I mean, to the point where we have negative trillions of dollars of negative yielding 13 debt. 13 trillion. Right. Uh, so where is it? I mean, is it stocks or bonds? Which is more overvalued? And then where would you kind of tilt towards in 2020? Compared to long-term valuation history, fixed income is the greater anomaly. Equity valuations in the U.S. compared to the long-run history point to somewhat below average long-term returns. Nothing like where we were in 1999 and certainly not the opportunity uh, that we had 10 years ago when markets were deeply depressed and no one wanted to invest. Now, if you take a look at fixed income, though, the global yield, including emerging markets, including high yield debt, so sub-investment grade, just about 1.6%. 
the U.S. higher so we can take a, a higher position, particularly in U.S. municipal bonds for those investors that can take advantage of that tax situation. But overall, we're underweight fixed income, we're overweight global equities because of these relative valuations. And the fact is that we don't believe that we're at the end of an economic expansion.